So I wanted to talk to you about our kind of changing relationship with with COVID. Um, we've all been sort of fixating on the number. Well, I think in uh, in COVID zero countries or countries that have had a, a, done a reasonably good job at suppressing the transmission, focusing on on cases um, and. We saw in Singapore, even after they got to a really high uh, proportion of their population fully immunized and started opening up, that, that cases spiked and that had a bit of a flow on effect of freaking people out. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on um, this sort of transition um, as we um, begin to open up while we've, um, got a high proportion of our population uh, double vaccinated. Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think the whole issue of staying focused on COVID zero isn't, isn't just about, you know, complacency and the other things people talk about, you know, or thinking we can keep our international borders closed. It was such a mental exercise in, in places like Victoria where that was kind of being used to keep people focused on lockdown. So it became a way of a necessary way for a lot of people to think in order to put up with what was being asked of them. And when you're very much in that mindset, then the prospect of opening up for some is a great relief. But for there are quite a few, there is a level of anxiety that comes with this, which is and I know this, I hear from them directly, you know, people saying, I'll be able to go to a cafe, but I'm going to be too scared to go, you know. And so our messaging, you know, has to really help people understand the safety going ahead. We also have to prepare them for the likelihood that we could see rising cases. But of course, for some people, that then just reinforces their fear of moving ahead and then they want to pull back again. So it's a really difficult thing to manage, you know, people's understanding of risk is complex at the best of times. But, you know, it has depended so much on people's experience within the country, you know, whether they've been in a state where they hear that in the distance, but life's normal, it just means they can't travel interstate and there are things they're aware of, but it's not the same as living in lockdown or worse, you know, living in a, in a hotspot LGA where you know people in your community who've been unwell and you know, um, this terrible virus takes lives, you know. So you're trying to manage people's um, understanding and expectation in a way that doesn't overstate the risks, but that actually paints as clear a picture as you can possibly paint about the risks going ahead and, and hope people come with you. I know um, a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to, to um, write something positive about Sydney. And, um, and there was a lot that was actually really impressive. And, and I think that's the other challenge with the virus now in our community. It's a different breed. <laughs> you know, it's a different variant to the ones we've had before. And actually achieving even a low level of control um, on growth is, is something that you have to fight really hard for and is, is a sign of success. And so I talked about the fact that the, the growth number, that reproduction number was 1.3 for 60 days in Sydney as they built up from a low base, those vaccination rates, um, and talked about that being a success story. And, and it was really interesting because half the people in the community <laughs> seemed to come straight on and say, thank you, we just needed to understand the epidemiology. We needed to see what was going on. And all we see is a daily rise in cases, but we don't know anything else. And we've heard modelling, but we don't really see it. We don't get modelling. And this actually made sense to them. But there are other people that just said, you know, don't you know that the case numbers going up is not control? You know, you idiot. <laughs> it, was, it was an extraordinary reaction. But um, at the end of the day, you know, it proved true. The numbers were turning around. The reproductive number I predicted at that stage was, was actually showing a plateau. And of course, you don't see it in the real case numbers for a few more days. But, you know, we went the start of the plateau right then. And, and now we see the benefits with case numbers coming down. Um, does that help people if they're really trepidatious about opening up? Probably not, because it's almost more like we've worked so hard to get the numbers down. Why would we open up, you know? So I think it's, it's the, main, the main focus, and it's actually the focus in the national plan that doesn't get talked about nearly enough. And, and a lot of us are doing a lot of talking about this now for this very reason, 
it is about the wedge that you put between case numbers and hospitalizations. And it's the uncoupling of those numbers. So the health department has to worry about the numbers in the community, but a smaller percentage will end up in hospital. So if those numbers rise incredibly, you might see an impact on hospitals and that's what you need to manage. Um, but at this stage, you know, the success in reducing hospitalisation is already showing up even with the short term modelling with Burnett, you know, the numbers in hospital just uh, are under their estimates, even though case numbers, you know, are tracking as high, if not higher than they thought they are week on week in Victoria. So same thing happened in New South Wales. So that's a sign that, you know, we are, we can change our relationship with the virus. It's not necessarily in every infection now that puts the individual at risk of symptomatic disease, let alone um, people having serious illness. So we have to um, retrain our minds, you know, um, to treat this differently. It's still not the flu. Uh, there are still things people need to be aware of in terms of testing and the value of vaccination if they haven't done that already. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's very different to where we were you know, six months ago. When we came out of lockdown and we, we were looking to open up and we thought we might have a vaccine uh, a year ago in Victoria, then the, the, it was very different then as well because we didn't have Delta. And so it was the problem with Delta then emerging and meaning that our normal contact tracing didn't work as well, that we had to deal with, with outbreaks with lockdown. But that's the other game changer. With the vaccination, if you can start to contain spread, combination of public health response, some still precautions in place, because we're not opening up completely immediately, um, and the vaccine working just to make less people susceptible to infection. And the latest data, everyone's saying it's terrible because it means your, your likelihood of passing the virus on is lower if you have the vaccine, but only for three months. Three months is everything. Three months, you know, helps you transition out of lockdown. And most people will have had their second dose within the last three months. So they'll be at their kind of best in terms of, even if they get infected, not passing it on. The, the, these latest data show us that Pfizer reduces your risk of infection, even some time out of any infection by 50%. You know, that's better than we thought, but we know it still protects from hospitalization. 95%, which is actually why we started with the vaccines. And so there's this other attitude that we kind of always look for the worst. You know, it's that half glass empty view of the tools we have in hand now. Um, and we're getting better treatments. We've got monoclonal antibodies already in the country for those people who I do worry about, the people that can't be vaccinated or won't have the benefits of that same level of immune response if they are vaccinated. So, you know, whether it's the little red pill or antibodies that we already have in a, in a jar that we can <laughs> give to people, you know, they're, they're really important because it helps um, that secondary layer of protection that means even if people are infected and they're at risk, there's, there's more we can do now than we could do, you know, even three months ago. So I think people can be confident and optimistic. Um, but they have to be a little bit brave too, because it is going to be this sort of changing their relationship with the virus, actually taking advantage of the freedoms available to them. And, uh, and, and I think that remains a risk that there's going to be people who never really came out of lockdown, even though states have uh, in the past, some people stayed in lockdown because they found that, that more secure. And I think that's what worries me is that we'll, we'll move ahead and there'll be a silent, but, but significant minority of people who no longer live the way that people should be able to live. You know, we'll know they'll be at risk of social exclusion in a way. And that's a major concern from a health point of view. We know that um, social inclusion is really important for health. It's really important for monitoring your own health. We've seen, you know, people shy away from healthcare and from their normal testing for chronic conditions all of those things, if you have that, that um, unconscious kind of pushback and say, well, I'll put it off, I'll do it later, it's, I, don't, I don't feel like going out, or medical centres is where you find people with a the virus, then those costs will, will continue when they don't need to. And so there's some work to be done really about continuing with this effort to explain risk to people in a 
in a in a credible way so that that actually shifts that that risk tolerance in the community and and but first thing we need to do is make sure that people have a, a reasonable understanding of risk then we can deal with their ability to um to live with that risk yeah i wonder too whether our pcr testing isn't really doing any favors in terms of finding people who are positive for viral rna in their you know nasal uh, or nasal pharyngeal cavity um that doesn't necessarily mean that they have um covid uh you know they it, it means that they've been exposed to the virus their own antibodies uh, from vaccination might be doing a, a great job in uh, in uh, clearing those um, ver infectious virions, um, and what might be detected is actually viral debris, and we we don't yeah. know that with with PCR tests. So um, uh, when people come back positive, they're being sort of recorded as a COVID case, and I don't I find that a little bit unhelpful when in fact if they are asymptomatic, they're just PCR positive. Um, and uh, yeah, do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? There's a, there's a few things going on there. You know, firstly, um, you're right. You know, you, you can continue to shed virus for some time. It's not an indicator of your infectiousness or even having a, a, an active infection. It's a good indicator that you've had an infection. And a lot of people aren't long-term shedders, but some are. So, you know, that infection might've been three months ago, but for the majority, it's, it's, it's a sign of a recent infection. Um, in Australia, we had such low infection rates outside of these outbreaks, that um, PCR testing was never challenged in the same way as it is overseas, where, you know, it might have been an infection three months ago here, you would have known about it probably, you know, even though we don't capture all cases. Once you're vaccinated, it's it's interesting because you're exposed, there's sort of all these different levels in pathogenesis, but you know, you're exposed, you might develop an infection, and it might only be in your nose and throat. If you're vaccinated, it's even more likely that that's the case. Um, and then you go through a phase as soon as it kind of gets in and into the system and the primed immune response activates, you can shut down that um, infection very quickly. Still an infection, you still had your peak infectious period. You're probably not as likely to be infectious for as long as, as someone who's unvaccinated. And in fact, you may not be infectious by the time they're tested. And that's where the rapid antigen testing is, is interesting. You know, it's almost like you'd use that to back up PCR tests to say, all right, you know, you've tested positive, you've got no symptoms, um, you've been at home for three days. It means that your exposure was probably at least four days ago. We'll do a rapid antigen test, you're negative. You know, you're okay. And uh, probably don't have to fully isolate even, you know. So I think there are things that they, they will be doing going ahead that, that take account of how those tests work in different settings. Rapid antigen tests, you can get false positives and that would be really disappointing for you as well. If you didn't have symptoms and you're testing every day, you're probably gonna end up, you know, coming up as a positive. But while our rates in the community are actually quite high, that your know, chances of having the virus are now one in 500, you know, in Victoria, um, then, depending where you are, um, that then means, you know, the, the tests come into their own in a different way. And um, when we do have events, whether it's a GAT exam or whatever, then that's exactly what you want to do. You then can back those up with a PCR and make sure it's not a false positive. But if you get a positive PCR and you had a positive rapid antigen, it tells you, you know, you're likely a case and you're, you're infectious. So it's not about doubling the testing. It'd only be in certain circumstances, but you know, if you have a, an elderly, frail relative and you want to spend time with them and they, they aren't protected, um, then, then I think having a good understanding of your own infection status is important. And so testing will help us navigate our way through it. But I think there's still going to be that, um, that sense of people that, you know, everyone in the cafe they, they want to go to won't be testing every day and therefore they still feel, you know, insecure. But the point coming back to those latest results coming out of the UK study this week is not only that actually are those protections probably better than we thought for any infection, um, it's also telling us that um, you're still less likely, you know, to be infected in the community because they're talking about uh, 
down the track, as I said, for the first few months, we've, we're going to have the highest rates of protection that we're going to have. Some people with symptoms that are still in that group, you know, who, who do get the, the virus will be testing and not going out and, you know, mixing. So I think the data, the other data out of the UK, which is um, random, you know, testing in the population that finds that only uh, the infection rate is only one third in the people who are fully vaccinated, what it is in the unvaccinated is probably still a pretty good indicator. The UK said three times less, the US data says five times less, but that's with Pfizer. So I think, you know, on average, we, we could probably match UK's um, vaccine profile. So given we've had most of our vaccination uptake in the last couple of months, that actually carries us through three months, <laughs> you know, after that second dose. And so, and it, it's most targeted in the people doing most mixing. And if we do have boosters, it's likely to be in the people who are the frontline exposed and the people most vulnerable. And if, if that's coming in next year after we get through, you know, this first round, then that adds another layer of protection at the population level as well. So I think, you know, it comes back to this idea that we've got more in our toolkit than we thought we were going to have. And we should utilise that to do as much as we possibly can safely. And that's both at the individual level and the population level. And it's how you, you communicate that. And, you know, we're, we're still dealing with the, the last, vestiges of the anti-vax campaigners who are trying to undermine everything. They're the same people that still want us using ivermectin, even though it isn't, you know, doesn't have the evidence. Um, but then they also want these new drugs to be out now, you know, like the, the Merck's red pill, because they could have that instead of having a, a vaccine, even though it only ever gives them 50% chance of not going to hospital, but that's when they've already got the infection anyway. So it's this strange world we're in where we're trying to manage risk and risk communication at a time where there's competing, I guess, interests in that public domain. And a lot of them, at the very least, add inconsistency, but, but often are still adding misinformation or if not disinformation. Yeah, I was just actually thinking about how uh, the advantage of, of um, immunising people fairly quickly and having a very sort of um, short period in which people have got maximal um, immunity from the vaccine and then opening up and whether you would get, as there is still ongoing transmission, some anamnestic boost um, from being fully vaccinated and then getting exposed again. Yeah, and I, I think that's the thing. We, we, when we're looking at Australia compared to overseas, particularly places like India, you know, it's really hard to know how we will travel because even with these waves that we think are enormous, you know, oh, my goodness, 1,700 cases in a day, um, is what other countries celebrate when they get down to that, you know. So we still haven't seen um, the majority of our population infected, you know, with our current active cases. That's still only one in 500 you know, in Victoria. And so there's 499 people that haven't seen the virus. But if you do have mixing that leads to more viral sharing, and that's primarily focused in the fully vaccinated with the, the strategy that they've put in place, then, then I agree. You know, you're actually having that challenge, that immunologic challenge um, that could in fact continue to kind of boost um, immunity. Now you'd argue that's still the case in places like the UK where they're doing these studies. Um, and maybe you don't get the kind of results they're seeing in those countries if you were in a country that was um, COVID zero, vaccinated, opened up and kept trying to keep COVID zero. In fact, you know, if it got away from, from us in that setting, we might find that the efficacy is not as good. And so that, that's a risk that we don't know. Um, but going ahead, that might be the thing that replaces the need for boosters in young, fit adults, you know. And... You know, that's that's I think ultimately what we're still learning, and the Australian government still doesn't have enough information to to know. Apart from Pfizer in the in the frail um, people with frail immune systems or immunocompromised systems, then um, then the rest is still a bit uncertain because we're looking at proxies or like population data. So this UK data is pretty important. You know, it gives us a different look at it, but it's it's still not that easy to predict what's going to yeah how it relates to us.
That's not the the healthcare worker um, study, is it? What what is it is? Yeah. So this is the one, uh, the one that looks at forward transmission. Yeah. I was thinking, is that um, uh, it's included in the in the Public Health England data that comes out, I think, and it's a yes. study. Yeah, but it's a more formal modelling study. Let me just make sure we're talking about the same one because we're tiredness. My uh, colleagues are also asking if you can talk about molnupiravir. Um, I realise that you're not a yeah. Um, pharmacist or a virologist, but um... yeah, I guess it's 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 really interesting from my point of view because I was I was talking to some people about you know prevention still better than cure, and they they couldn't believe that and they were saying what does that mean? <laughs> like, and I thought it's you know vaccination is still the thing that um, gives us takes a number of people out of the mix because they don't even get infected. Um, I'll just, I'm going to just do a quick search on one word that should pull it up. Uh, if I don't do this, I'll forget. No, for whatever reason. I'll come back to it. I might be able to find it. Um, so this particular drug, it's, it's, it's interim results because they're only halfway through the 15, 50 people they're monitoring. So, um, and it's interesting because they were, they were high risk sample. So that's the first thing. They were people that were high risk of being hospitalised anyway. And even in that group of the 725 or whatever they had, um, the results in on, they, um, I think the rates were something like 14% who were hospitalised versus seven. So it actually means even in those high risk groups, you know, it's still, um, thankfully, you know, under 20% of people end up in, in hospital. But if you can halve that well and good, still means seven out of every hundred people at risk who get infected end up in hospital. What's, what's perhaps even more exciting is, as Fauci pointed out, you know, that we had eight deaths in the placebo arm versus none. So that's that's important, but it's hard to know what that would translate to as a, as a percentage, you know, in a, in a broader population group. So this was a very targeted study and it's only the halfway mark on those results. But it's the same with the monoclonal antibodies in a way. I mean, they're, they're more difficult because, you know, you've got a, your IV and $1,500 a pop and but equally, a little red pill, I think it's something like eight pills a day for five days, you know, you really have to work at this. But you can potentially have it at home, which is the thing. If you can keep people out of hospital, um, particularly when they are infectious, because they're, they're infected, but you can give them something that reduces their risks by at least half, um, you know, or if you assess them to be at greater risk, then you'd, you'd organised for them to, have, to, have, to receive monoclonal antibodies. That would probably give them two-thirds reduced risk. So, but th that's your secondary uh, prevention. So primary prevention is your vaccine. Secondary prevention is, um, if, we're, if we're talking about serious illness as the end point, secondary prevention is, these, is identifying these people. So knowing that they're cases, so it comes back to testing and then having that assessment of their risk. And then the third part of that, you know, intervention is then um, the application of these treatments that can reduce their risk of escalating, but they have to be received early. This is all about catching people when they have an infection and they don't have that overwhelming immune response. If they started to proceed into that inflammatory stage, it's too late, you know, certainly for the Merck pill. Um, so you have to catch them before that point. So that, that testing and identifi identification of people is really critical. And then you have to have a way of catching the people that don't respond to that medication and still, you know, the 7% or whatever it will be, who still need hospitalisation and making sure that, you know, that they are monitored as closely for that need um, as they were before potentially we had these medications. So. Um, understanding who's at risk, using these well, 
having all the, the kind of steps in place to make sure that people are identified and can use them early enough to make a difference and that we still capture the, the 50% of people, you know, who, who might have gone to hospital anyway but who, who don't benefit from the drug. Um, kind of add a layer of complexity but a good layer. You know, if it's, it's halving the number of people from that group that end up in hospital. If you have people who just haven't been vaccinated and that's their only risk profile, you know, I think their risk of hospitalisation will depend on their age group. We know it's still, you know, can be high depending on comorbidity. So this might still be you know, that level of risk assessment. Um, but the whole point is people who are unvaccinated are already in that pool, more likely to be in that pool because they're more likely to be infected. Then they'll be looking at what the risks are. And I think particularly something like monoclonal antibodies, which will be a rare resource, it would be really frustrating if we wound up you know, chewing through our supply because we had people who were at risk of hospitalisation but hadn't had chosen not to be vaccinated and they were taking supply from people who couldn't be vaccinated or were vaccinated and it wasn't didn't work for them. And I think that's the thing. I You know, you kind of hear out there people going, oh, well, we've got these treatments, we don't need vaccines now. And I think that's a concern. They're not an unlimited resource. And even the process of managing them and monitoring people you know, you're much better if you don't have the infection in the first place. And even if you went down that path, you know, your chances of not going, of not going to hospital are actually 95% reduced if you're vaccinated for whatever your risk profile is. And I think that's the difficult thing. People don't, 50% is good enough, you know, where you think, actually, I'll take 95% any day. Well, I worked out the number needed to treat was 15. So you needed to um, give... 15 people who were at risk of, who had COVID, who were at risk of hospitalisation needed to, to save one them, from going. To save one from, from going to the hospital. Yep, yep, yeah. that's right, you're 7%. Yep. And I think, and that's true, but if you had to then say, well, we'll give it to anyone who's, who's at home to stop them going to hospital, no matter what their risk profile is, we just couldn't do it, you know. And it's, it's, it's yeah, you just have to look at, an extra thousand cases a day and if it's kind of flooding us because you mainly have well unvaccinated people but if uh one of those people then and we know they do get very very sick we've heard the stories from people who are you know no comorbidity wouldn't pick them up on a triage they're they're missed and and they don't get these drugs they end up in hospital and they die then people will be you know, ropeable, but in fact, you can't manage that many people. And it, it comes at the cost of managing those people that really have to rely on this more as their first line of defence, whereas for us, it's further down the line because our first line is vaccine. Yeah, I would like to think that in um, residential care facilities uh, where we know that may have been an exposure, we could do rapid antigen testing to, to see who is, is positive really quickly and then give them um, treatment, you know, as soon as they are symptomatic. Um, I would have thought that would be a, a good way. Yeah, and I think, you know, they might even do it for very frail people Prophylactic. when they're positive. They wouldn't wait for symptoms necessarily. Right. Um, and, and you're in a, a different situation. If you actually know, if, if, say, a worker turns out to be positive and you know they only work there one day, so you've got an exposure day, you can work from there to kind of figure out how long people have been exposed, when it's the right time to test. If you test too early, you know, you've got a very short incubation period for Delta, even shorter the time between, potentially, the time between exposure and infection. We know that can be as little as 30 hours, but for some people it still will be five days. <laughs> you know, there might be a longer incubation and, and wouldn't have symptoms till seven days. Um, but they probably, you know, are already incubating the virus. And what we don't really know is if you take this medication before the virus, you know, like it's post-exposure as opposed to even first indication of infection. But if you picked up someone on a, um, a, a rat test, you know, if you actually had someone who was showing up positive, then if you're tracking people each day with rapid antigen testing, you'll pick up when they get that rapid climb, which will be a couple of days before symptoms, and that's the time to give it to them. Yeah, right. And what would also be great with the study that's underway in the US, the phase three trial, is to figure out if it um, reduces the risk of long COVID. Yeah, yeah. And we don't, 
we don't really understand long COVID, whether that's because some people who don't even having symptoms in their acute infection still develop long COVID. So again, you'd argue actually not having COVID in your or SARS-CoV-2 in your system is still the best protection against long COVID. But if you intervene incredibly early in an infection, then then there's a hope without understanding the etiology of long COVID that that makes a difference. That you know, even a, a subclinical longer um, asymptomatic infection could potentially be setting you up for long COVID in a way that um, you know nipping it in the bud. And that we'll probably get a sense of that because vaccinated people who shut down their infections once they go beyond the mucosal linings um, are probably a good model for that. You know, it's it's might be the kind of equivalent of waiting till you actually see that um, that viral load, the detectable of viral load, and, and medicate people with um, with any of these treatments. And you know, if that if we find less long COVID in people who've had breakthrough infections, um, that would be telling. The problem with vaccinated people who have those initial infections that get shut down very quickly is you miss them. <laughs> you wouldn't even know they'd had them in most cases because they're, they're not going to likely be symptomatic um, and and never go on to develop symptoms. So we, we might never know. But um, yeah, which I think is why that UK know. study that was that uh, serially tests um, the healthcare workers is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that micro view, you know, it's a bit like talking here about shortening um, quarantine periods. And then people will always say, oh, but there's all those cases we get by, you know, on day 13. And I said, well, no, we don't. They're the cases that didn't have symptoms and didn't get tested since day two, <laughs> you know. And Victoria, we put a, an in-between day in for hotel quarantine and you start to get a better picture, you know, how many people tested positive after the day five test. So, yeah, you just have to test each day. And they were the first studies that showed us even what happens to your viral load and what happens with different variants, studies out of Asia, really important. So... You know, we've actually got a lot of data there. I don't know that we always use it as well as we might, you know, when, you, when you're tracking people and it's great to see the transmission, the household transmission studies were really important early on because they did show with vaccines that you saw a reduced spread. But that study didn't actually report the, the earlier health, Public Health England what the vaccination state, status was of other people in the household. And there's a, a slightly higher risk in the early days of vaccine rollouts that a household risk, if you like, of being vaccinated changes once you've got a healthcare worker in the household because they're more likely to share with other health workers. Their partners are often health workers. Or, you know, if if, um, if you're able to get vaccinated, health workers are probably going to encourage you to do so earlier. So, so there were subtle limitations with the study, but it did give us an idea that you could actually also reduce the risk of passing it on. So you're much less likely to be infected and you reduce the risk of passing on. But... Um, yeah, the, the, the recent studies are more complicated now because you've got the vaccination bars, they've also got the shift in variant, and they've also got the, um, the decline over time. And so that's really important because actually seeing it translate to infections is so much more informative than counting antibody levels. Yeah, I, I was um, got one last question before I let you go. I don't know if you've seen any of the studies that looked at um, face masks and Delta and how... Uh, it's showing that you really do need a pretty good fitting face mask yeah. um, that surgical masks with you know gaps and stuff are, are not going to be as protective as they might have been with uh, other variants. Do you have any thoughts on how when we do start opening up and if we do want to protect ourselves from any any infection, um, the need to be thinking a little bit more about how we protect ourselves indoors in sort of crowded situations? Masks outside of healthcare are still probably working in multiple ways. You know, at, at a broad level, they reduce your risk in some way. They don't give you zero risk. But, but it's, it's also strongly suggested, <laughs> if you look at how some people wear their masks, um, that it's, it's more than that. It's actually how it moderates behaviour and makes people aware. So it's, it's that sort of symbol to you that life is not normal and the likelihood that you'll do the other things that also protect you. So keeping your distance and being cognizant of that in a different way. The question is going ahead, not only is it Delta that we're dealing with and, and that the physical effects of the masks are more limited, um, 
And we know particularly the cloth masks, you know, which most people wear, um, or even less effective, even in community trials, um, looking at surgical, uh, basic surgical versus um, probably not well-maintained cloth masks. But also um, people are so used to wearing masks now, it probably doesn't work in the same way from a behavioural perspective because you kind of put it on and you don't think about it. You know, I quite like a mask in winter. It keeps my nose warm <laughs> if, you're, if you're out walking, but I hate it in summer, you know. And so but there's all these other things that are kind of going on. And if people are used to wearing masks, those, yeah, the, the trigger that it was might not be in, in place in the same way. So if other people are wearing, you still have a sort of a visual stimulus that reminds you to be to be safe. So we, we did see an effect of masks. And, and I think masks are probably a little bit like lockdown, dare I say it. But um, you, you have to use all these things sparingly. It's like antibiotics for that matter. You know, you, you start to, you've got to think of them all as finite resources and use them to the best effects at the right time. And that's why I always advocate that we should stop asking people to wear masks outdoors. Um, and it's not just saying, well, they're not doing it anyway, so stop making them. It's more than that. It means that, you know, they're actually handling their masks differently. They are wearing them outdoors when they're exercising and hot. It makes the mask dirtier and less useful anyway. And you end up um, running out of goodwill. You know, people have to be doing this voluntarily. You can never police it in the way um, some people imagine you should. And so it's somehow preserving it for the times where it matters most and the places where it matters most. And I think the latest evidence, you know, tells us that. But coming back to your main point about how do we protect ourselves, I think that's the concern. You know, we, we thought that actually saying you wear masks in your workplace, you know, when you go back into the office would, would help. And it probably still does, but it's probably not as good as it was with previous variants. And it really is the shift in emphasis onto things like, you know, air turnover and ventilation and spacing and all the other things. And we have to go there anyway. And we'd actually built a world that made us vulnerable to infections. You know, we built a world where we know we've aggravated uh, our risk for zoonoses because we've you know, infringed on, on uh, natural habitats in ways you shouldn't. And we've done the same thing. I mean, if you, if you could, as a, as a microbe, you know, design how a human population would would live and work, you'd build our cities. <laughs> you know, they're just perfect. So I'll put a whole lot of people in a tower and it's, we move up away from public housing towers and try and get people into homes and have more space. And yet we grow our affluent public housing tower, our private housing towers. Um, and even, even worse because they have communal gyms and all those things that, you know, it's not about having one laundry on the floor, which might be a problem. It's actually everybody in an estate using um, you know, shared entertainment facilities and gyms and so on. So I just think, you know, we've, we, we have to rethink how, we, how our world is. And some of that has to happen now, including, you know, retro fixing our, our air con and so on. Um, and others will be how we design a way in the future. That means the little bit of good mass do becomes irrelevant because you've actually got the air turnover that, that protects you against Delta, as well as any other other variant or other infections, including the common cold, which you might not have to get as a given once it starts running around the office at work. Cool. I'll, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time, Catherine. It's very helpful. Um, and we may uh, put this on YouTube. So stand by. All right. All right. All right. Thanks again. Let me know. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.